All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. I've been going over the PowerPoint presentations for Web Development and Design Foundations with HTML5 7th Edition by Terry Felt Morris, and we're up to Chapter 10, which is entitled Web Development. Our objectives describe the skills, functions, and job roles needed for a successful web development project, utilize the stages in the standard SDLC or Systems Development Lifecycle, identify other common system development methodologies, apply the SDLC to web development projects, describe the activities in the conceptualization, analysis, design, production, testing, launch, maintenance, and evaluation stages of a website project. Compare the goals of a website to the results as part of the evaluation phase. Find the right web host provider for your website and choose a domain name for your website. So this chapter discusses skills that, that are needed for large-scale project development and it talks to, it also introduces some kind of fundamental things. So let's look at some of the people here that they say you need for a successful large-scale project. First is the project manager, and as you probably guess, the project manager is either going to be a person or it's going to be a team. But regardless, the, the role of the project manager is to oversee the web site development process and coordinate all activities. The information architect will be responsible for helping to clarify the mission and goals of the site. They determine the functionality of the site. They're instrumental in defining the site organization, the site navigation, and the site labeling. Next is kind of a new one, the user experience designer, also called the UX designer. The user experience is the user's interaction with a product, an application, or a website. So this designer focuses on the user's interaction with the website. They want to make the basically the idea of the, the use of the website as pleasing to the user as possible. The marketing representative will handle the organization's marketing plan and come up with their goals. The copywriter and editor, well, they prepare and they evaluate the copy, the, the actual copy that goes onto the site. The content manager, participates in the strategic and creative development and enhancement of the website. They're kind of looking at it from a high level. All right. The graphic designer determines the appropriate use of color and graphics. They might be responsible for designing web frames or wireframes, I should say, page layouts, if you have to create a new logo, etc., anything like that. The database administrator if the site is going to include a database component, and most sites today do, all right, we'll be responsible for overseeing that. The network administrator will configure and maintain the web server or web server farm. There could be several of them. This individual or usually this team will also install and maintain system hardware and software and control the security process. Finally, the web developer slash designer. The designer is more concerned with the CSS and maybe a little light HTML, and they may even fulfill some of the graphic job duties. The developer, on the other hand, is going to be more concerned with HTML, CSS, but also having to do with the, with the uh, client-side scripting, such as JavaScript. As it says, the skills are essentially the same on a small project and as on a large project, except on a small project or in a smaller company, each person, as it says, may wear many hats and may have to juggle many different job roles. Some of the jobs may even be outsourced. Staffing criteria, again, finding the right people to work on a project is crucial. You gotta have the right mix. Here's the website development life cycle. 
that is shown here. Now this life cycle is what is shown on the bottom of page 438. I guess they're not going to show. I thought they were going to show the, but they don't. Okay. I thought they were also going to show the systems development life cycle, but they don't here. All right. This particular website development cycle, it's kind of a guide to you being successful in managing a website project. So notice what do you have here? Well, you've got conceptualization. So someone identifies some kind of an opportunity. It could be changing something that already exists or creating something new. From there, you go into the analysis phase where you gather requirements. You go to the design phase where you come up with one or more solutions. You go into production where you create the constant content rather and actually start to construct the site. You test. You launch, where you publish the site. You maintain, where you fix and enhance the site. You evaluate, where you review the site and you say, you know, then do we start over on the next phase? Now, this is similar to the Systems Development Lifecycle, or SDLC. Just so you know, it's not the same, but it is, it is similar. Okay? In the Systems Development Lifecycle, you start with some, some kind of a feasibility study is what you want to do worth doing. Then you go to analysis, then you go to design, then you go to implementation, and then the maintenance. So notice the analysis, the design, the implementation, which is really in here, and the maintenance is very similar between these two. Now there's other website development methodologies that can be used also. All right, and some of those are, are mentioned on the top of page 439. There's prototyping. What a prototype is, I, this is my definition, not exactly the one in the book, but I call a prototype, it's a limited working model. In other words, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. Spiral systems development, where small portions of a project are completed one after another. There's JAD, which is Joint Application Development, which focuses on group meetings and collaboration between the users and developers of a website or a system. System, rather, there's a Agile Website Development, where basically what you do is you break the projects and project into all sorts of little mini phases. And there's organization-specific development methodologies. So some companies have developed their own way of doing things. But as far as web, web development, now notice conceptualization. One of the tasks during conceptual, conceptualization is to determine the site's long-term and short-term goals or missions. You are, as it says, determining your intended audience. From there, we're going to analysis, where you determine the information topics. You organize the information you want to present in the site into some kind of a hierarchical manner. You determine the functional requirements. You state what the site will do. Not how it will do it, but what it will do. You determine your environmental requirements. You know, what hardware will you need? What operating system will you need? What will your memory be, etc. You determine your content requirements. Are you, then you compare what we've done with what's new. In other words, are you going to be doing something new or are you going to be modifying something that exists? You review competitor sites. That's a great way to learn about anything. All right. You estimate your costs and you do some kind of a cost-benefit analysis. From there, we go to the design phase. So... Once everybody knows what's needed, now you've got to determine how you're going to accomplish it. The design tasks are typically completed by the project manager, along with the information architect and other analysts. Some common stuff you're going to do in here, you'll choose a site organization. We talked back in Chapter 5 about hierarchical versus linear versus random, and the majority of sites today are hierarchical in nature. You design the prototype. 
So you sketch out the design on paper, or then you maybe go to a wireframe. You design a page layout. You determine the visual aesthetic and layout with wireframes. And then you document each page. You're not creating them yet, but you're saying what's going to be on each page. From there, you go to production. And during this time, all of the previous work comes together. And ideally, this is going to be a, a website, an effect, a highly effective website. So the web designers and web developers are critical here. You choose an authoring tool. You know, are you going to use a, a tool like Dreamweaver, for example? You start to organize your site files. You develop and you individually test components. <clears throat> you test each unit together in what's called unit testing. But then you have to take the units and test them, you know, bring them together also in the regular testing phase. In there, you're testing on every browser you can, every version of every browser you can, every different screen resolution you can possibly utilize, different bandwidths, test from another location, test mobile. You just don't stop testing. As it says on the bottom, you just keep testing. Some different types of testing. <clears throat> There's automated testing that you can do. All right, where you can, where there is some stuff where you, it, it's automated, so you can just kind of turn something on, let it run, and see what's happening. But nothing beats things like usability testing, where, as it says, you actually have people come in and test your site. All right, we've got accessibility testing. Or was that up here? Nope. We've got accessibility testing where all individuals test everything. So you want to make sure that indeed that the site will be fine for people who have any kind of a disability. You've got usability testing. Again, where you're testing the user's experience. How easy is it to navigate your way through the site? How efficient is the site set up? All right. Is it memorable? In other words, if you leave the site and come back, can you figure out, you know, what exactly has happened and how to get it from here to there? The visitors make errors when they're going through here. And is it a satisfying experience? From there, you're ready to go over and launch. So once the lat the the test website has been approved, it's published to the live production in what's called a launch. <clears throat> and again, you're still testing, testing, testing throughout all of this. Maintenance. Maintenance doesn't end. You know, some people tell you that maintenance actually begins as soon as you start working on the site to begin with. All right, and literally it never does end. <clears throat> Finally, there is evaluation. When you visit to see, in other words, did, did we meet our goals, our objectives, etc.? And if not, can we develop a plan to better meet their goals and objectives, etc. in the future? All right, switching track a little bit, and this is the bottom of page 446. And it goes on to the top of 448. They talk about domain name <clears throat> overview. Your domain name, for instance, Rankin is the domain name. It's, since it's an educational site, it's .edu. Now, my name is Jeff Scott, and if I wanted to know if I wanted to create my own site and put in www.jeffscott.com, if it comes back with an error message, I can be fairly, fairly certain. All right, well, Jeff Scott is Elton John. Okay. But uh, I can be fairly certain that the, that would be available. Well, I'll put my whole name in there. Jeffrey Paul Scott.com. All right, notice not found. Typic typically, and I'm going to try it again, I'm going to put the HTTP in front of it. HTTP colon slash slash. 
www.jeffreypaulscott.com. That probably says that that site is available. Now, either the site is available or someone has bought it and they're doing what's called cyber squatting on it, where they're holding it. So if I want it, somebody will tell me that it's not available and then I can find out who owns it and possibly buy it from them. So a crucial part of establishing an effective web presence is your domain name. It should describe the business. Let's take a look. It should be as brief as possible. You shouldn't have hyphens in it, it just confuses people. There's more than .com. All right. You, what you should do is start to brainstorm potential keywords that people would use and that would be basically involved in this. All right. Avoid trademark words and phrases. Know your territory. Verify what's available. And I already started showing you that. As far as registering a domain name, there's a lot of places that you can go. Some places recommend that wherever you're going to, to go to house your website, for example, GoDaddy, you do not go to the same place to, um, you do not go to the same place in order to um, register your domain name. Other places say it's not a problem. But there's typically a, a small fee for doing that, for actually registering and it's usually an annual fee for registration. It shields your personal information from unwanted spam and other things, but typically you'll want to do that. Web hosting, there's really two or three, probably maybe three or four types of web hosting. The web host provider is the organization that offers you storage for your website. And they make sure that your website is up and available and running. Now there's different types that you can do use here. Again, it says a good website hosting service will provide a robust, reliable home for your website. Typically what they say is it should be up 99.9% .9 of the time. You typically, you know, again, for a commercial website, never use a free web host. There is a reason it's free. Now sometimes some of the stuff that's in there is free, that's free rather, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm, I'm not bashing it. But what you might find is it's, you know, again, it's probably not going to be up 99.9% .9 of the time. That's just the way that it typically works. So if you've got a small to medium-sized website, you might want to consider virtual hosting. With virtual hosting, you are, you are sharing a web server with other companies. And typically what that company does is it provides the web server into a bunch of different virtual domains, okay? You can have <clears throat> a dedicated hosting where you rent and exclusively use a computer and a connection so it's just yours. You can have co-located um, hosting and with co-located hosting you use a computer that your organization has purchased and configured. But it's typically housed and connected to the internet through some other company. So there's dedicated and there's co-located. There's a number of factors to consider when you choose your web host. And there is a list of these things that are in Table 10.1 on page 450, and they're shown right here also. But again, they're all things that you, as someone who is going to go through this process, at least have to be aware of. All right? Things like, you know, a key one, the price. Do they provide site statistics? Do they back up on a regular basis? All right, do they support multiple operating systems? Do they support multiple types of web server software? Do they have good technical support? Do they have enough disk space, etc.? So as it mentions right here, this chapter introduced you to both the systems development lifecycle and then showed its similarities 
to the web development life cycle. Different job roles in a web development prog um, in a well in a web development uh, project were discussed, and we also talked a little bit about domain name and web hosting, and that's it. So when I come back and go into the next chapter, we will be going over chapter 11, which begins on page 457 and discusses web multimedia and interactivity. So I'll be back with that lecture shortly.